in Advent, here again in Norwalk, here in Connecticut, in the epistle for this fourth Sunday of Advent is taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4. Brethren, let a man so account, to us, account us as the ministers of Christ and dispensers of the mysteries of God. Here now it is required among the dispensers that a man be found faithful. But to me it is a very small thing to be judged by you or by man's day. But neither do I judge my own self. For I am not conscious to myself of anything, yet I am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. And therefore judge not before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise from God. And then the Gospel. Taking that according to St. Luke chapter 3. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother Tetrarch of Eturia, in the country of, of Trachonitis and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilina, under the high priest Annas and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord was made unto John, the son of Zachary, in the desert. And he came into all the country that were about the Jordan, preaching the baptism of penance, for the remission of sins, as it was written in the book of the sayings of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways plain, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Those are the words of today's Holy Gospel. So, Father, Son, the Holy Ghost, Amen. So today, a few considerations in this fourth Sunday. Remember that Advent <coughs> means coming, and Advent is not only the coming for the first coming of our Lord Jesus, remembrance of the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, when He came at the two thousand years ago, on in in, uh, in Bethlehem and on the cross, but also preparation for the second coming. And very similar to the, in a similar way, to the season after Pentecost, where there's always 24 Sundays after Pentecost, but we don't know when that 24th Sunday is. We don't know when the Day of Judgment is. And that uh, the, the Day of Judgment could be 23 Sundays after, or 22 Sundays after Pentecost, or 28 Sundays, or even 24 Sundays. But somewhere between 22 and 28 Sundays is the length of time. But it's always the 24th and last Sunday at Pentecost. The day, in other words, is a precise day of judgment. In a similar way, Christmas, December 25th, is always the day in which Christ is born, but the day of the week varies. So that the fourth Sunday is not always the same distance from the, the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we can say, so that when we're talking about the coming of our Lord, He comes always at a precise time. Whether he comes in judgment at the end of the world, the 24th Sunday at Pentecost, or it's coming the first time, which was on December 25th, in the year 1 AD, when our Lord Jesus Christ was born. He chose to be born on the same day that 153 years before, Judas Maccabeus had purified the temple. And he, he chose to be born on that, on that day, and that, so that day was, the day is important. And the same thing with the ending of the world, that the day of judgment is coming. And here we consider the personal side of the judgment. On the 24th Sunday of the Pentecost, the main consideration is the judgment coming for the whole world. That every single man shall experience the judgment. That the whole world shall experience the judgment. All kingdoms will experience the judgment. But remember the season of Advent is a primarily preparing for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But on a particular day, the day in which I shall meet our Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that each day we're closer, but I don't know, some years, even though it's always December 25th, Christmas, but some years it's a Monday after, the, the day after the fourth Sunday. Other years it's eight days, late, seven days later, the next Sunday, and so, or Saturday, Friday, Thursday, and so on. This year it's a Friday, so five days, six days. The sixth day from now shall be the day of Christmas. And at midnight or Thursday night, there will be the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh. And that, uh, so that there's going to be a, a day of the judgment. And this is considered in this, in this fourth Sunday. In the fourth Sunday of, of, after, uh, 
after, after, after the, uh, in the season of Advent. And the first, the recognition that Christ comes even in my own individual life. It has to do with the whole of humanity, that I belong to the whole of humanity. Here's when it says, Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem, and, and, uh, and, and St. John the Baptist came in order to prepare his coming. When did it happen? What, it happened at a precise time in which each person's individual life is connected with everyone else's individual life. So that our lives are not completely alone. So that, that's why it says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being the governor of Judea, and Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, and Philip his brother, Tetrarch of, Tetrarch of Etruria, and Lysanias, and then and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilina, under the high priests Annas and Caiaphas. So to triangulate the exact moment when we arrived, and that Jesus Christ chose to be arrived when Annas and Caiaphas, in his, in his public ministry, when he was 30 years old, during the reign of the Annas and Caiaphas, during the time of Pontius Pilate, in the time of Lysanias, in the time of Philip, and that therefore he came at a precise moment, a precise time, in relation not only to the whole world, but in relationship to me. So that there's a personal side of the judgment. We say oftentimes when the, and when the general judgment comes, it's like a city a walled city in which the army goes out to fight against the enemy, they go out and fight against the enemy, then they retreat back to the walls. And the gatekeepers, they watch all the soldiers come in from the battle, and they close the gates only after the last soldier has come in. When the last of our soldiers has come in, then we close the gates. We leave the gates open, even though the enemy is attacking, and the enemy can get inside the gates, just like our own soldiers get inside the gates. Some enemy do get inside the gates, but we wait until the last of our friends gets through the gates, and then the gate is closed. And so we see that there are two sides of the precision of God. God sends his moment of judgment when the world as a whole is ready, and he sends his moment of judgment when this individual is ready. He's just waiting for that last soldier to get in. So it had to be Philip who was in charge. It had to be Pontius Pilate that was in charge. And Lysanias that was in charge. And Annas and Caiaphas. And every other individual in the world in their particular places. And when they were all in place, when they were 100% in place, then Jesus Christ sent John the Baptist at the age of 30 to go out and prepare his coming. And 30 years before, he had decided at the precise moment that he would be, he would be born. He would be born at the precise moment. And so that they, 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 he would choose the moment of his birth in the exact moment based not only on the whole world, but on the individuals. And here also, you're reminded that my personal life, my individual decisions, my preparation for Jesus Christ coming to judge my soul, it is part of the whole of history. So when I consider my own judgment, what am I going to be judged for? When a soldier comes to judgment, and when the, when the steward comes to judgment, render an account of thy stewardship, for thou canst be steward no longer. The steward's going to be judged. What's he going to be judged on? What is going to be the criteria of our judgment? The judge, the, the judge is not going to say, you know, did you go to bed on time? Did you get up on time? Uh, you know, were you nice to people? No, you are a steward. Did you take care of my stuff? Did you leave things exactly like I told you to leave them? Did you keep things in order? Did you run the house the way I would run the house if I was still there? I had to go out and I'm coming back. Did you run the house according to my rules? Did you arrange things the way that I had to arrange them? Did you do your duty as a steward? That is going to be the primary question. And, that, and, and the reason why you go to bed at night, and the reason why you get up in the morning, and the reason why you exercise and do all the things you do, is in order to be able to fulfill your duty as a steward in the house. And we must remember, in my own personal journey to become a saint, in my own personal journey to prepare for my salvation, in the last 500 years, many, many saints at the church, many churchmen have emphasized in what's called the devotio moderna, the modern devotion. They have to emphasize that you want to prepare for heaven. All that matters is you got to save your soul. That's all that matters. you got to save your soul. So it doesn't matter if your wife doesn't save hers, if your kids don't save theirs, you try to get them to save their souls because they're closer to you. If the world goes to hell in a handbasket, that doesn't matter. You must take care of your soul. You need to say your prayers. You need to live your supernatural life. You need to be penance and live your life. And then when you die, Jesus Christ will ask you, did you live a good life? Did you sleep well? Did you do penance? Did you pray? Did you fast? Uh, did you do spiritual things? Did you obey the commandments? Fine, you can come into heaven. And this is the idea of the judgment. But notice we're talking here about the judgment on the fourth Sunday of Advent. Because in the Middle Ages, 
The primary focus of the church on this season of Advent always was the second coming of Jesus Christ. And just like when he came 2,000 years ago, he came at a precise time. He came into a precise place. He came exactly as things should be. And the world was ready for his coming. What would have happened if those shepherds weren't taking care of their sheep that night? If they weren't taking care of the sheep, some of them did not own the sheep. Some of them were working for someone else. If they weren't doing their duty and taking care of the sheep in the middle of the night, they would never have heard the angels sing. And, if, 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 and the same with the, with the three kings. If they weren't watching the stars and watching the stars, and why were they watching the stars? And one of their duties in watching the stars was to look for that new star that their great-grandfather the, the great Balaam told would one day come. They were watching for that star. And when they saw that star, they said, the king of kings has come. And we want to see the king of kings. And so that's why they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It wasn't, I'm bringing gold because, you know, that's because I'm rich and I want you to know that I'm rich and this is the best gift I can give. I'm bringing frankincense because it's a more spiritual gift and so on. And I'm bringing my gift because it's my gift. These gifts were brought to signify what Jesus Christ is for the whole world. One brought gold because that signifies that he is king. Another brought frankincense, because that signifies that he is God. And one brought myrrh, because that signifies that he is going to die for our sins. And the man of gold, frankincense, and myrrh was born in that cave, and they brought gifts of gold in the name of all humanity. And they brought frankincense in the name of all humanity, and myrrh in the name of all humanity. So that the one gave frankincense, it included the other two that gave gold and myrrh, and so on. Each one has a part to play in the whole of salvation, in the whole of judgment. So when I go to judgment, what is Jesus Christ going to ask me? We look at the situation of Dives and Lazarus. When Dives went to judgment, notice what Jesus Christ did not ask him, what God did not ask him. Did you obey the commandments? Did you do all the, fulfill all the laws of the Jews? Because Dives did obey the commandments. Dives did fulfill all the laws of the Jews. He did all the rules and regulations. He went to Mass on Sunday. He did all the things he's supposed to do. He was an obedient servant. But what did God say? What did you do in my kingdom? You are a soldier in my kingdom. I didn't make you to be healthy. That's one of the modern idiotic things that modern soldiers say. Modern soldiers say, I go and fought. One guy told me I went to Iraq and I went there because I was just trying to defend me and my brothers. So you do that much better by staying back here in a bar. It's a lot safer. You don't go to Iraq to defend yourself. You don't go to Iraq to be safe. You don't go to Iraq to defend your buddies. You tell your buddies, stay at home if he wants to be safe. Soldiers don't go to war to be safe. And they don't go to battle in order to come out. It's not the duty of the general to send his soldiers into war to make sure they are safe. To make sure they come out. The duty of a general is to win a war for his king, and the duty of a general is to conquer a land for his kingdom, or to defend the land for his kingdom. And if he dies, he dies. If he lives, he lives. But either way, he is useless if he doesn't do that work for the kingdom. And we have forgotten now that I'm going to go to judgment. I'm going to be judged by God. Jesus Christ is coming to judge me. And when he comes to judge, he's not going to ask, did you say your rosary every day? Did you uh, go to bed on time? Were you very spiritual? Did you remember to go to confession? Were you holy? Were you, were you taking care of your own little family? Were you being a good person? Fine, come to me, beloved of my father. That isn't what happens. When Divas went to the judgment, these questions are not even mentioned, even though he had to do those things. Rather, God said, there was a poor man, Lazarus, who was outside the gate of your house. Why didn't you feed him? Now, when I recognize that I am a soldier, when you receive the sacrament of confirmation, baptism means you're a member of the army of Christ. But when you receive the sacrament of confirmation, you're a soldier. What's a soldier? A soldier is one who defends the kingdom, a one who attacks the wicked, a one who does things for the kingdom and for the king and for the army. He's not about himself. A good soldier is not one that survives war. A good soldier is one that kills the bad guys, that defends the citadel. And so the question is, am I killing the bad guys in my supernatural life? Am I defending the citadel of the kingdom of God? 
Am I spreading his kingdom? Am I imitating him in relationship to others? That's why it says everywhere throughout sacred scripture and throughout the fathers of the search that if you cannot be good to him you can see, how can you be good to him whom you cannot see? We don't see God in his, in his spirituality, in his, in, his, in, his, in his divinity, to our eyes, but we see our neighbors. And if we can't take care of our neighbors when we can see, then we can't take care of God. Who we, can't, we cannot say that we are taking care of God who we do not see. That's one problem. But the other is, what does God demand of me? I am a soldier. When a soldier comes in, do you say, did you, did you keep your uniform clean? Do we have to buy you to waste money in a new uniform? No. Did you do your duty as a soldier? And you blow up the enemy. Did you do your work as a soldier? When we say we're soldiers of Christ, what am I going to be judged when I die? I'm going to be judged as a soldier. Did I do my duty as a soldier? And therefore we have to look outside of ourselves. When a soldier sits inside of his citadel, sits inside of his tower, his watchtower, his duty is not to protect himself. His duty is to keep his eyes peeled for the enemy that's coming. That's what he is supposed to do. And, these, and allow those that are good to come inside the gates to keep those that are bad outside the gates. It's the first duty of the priest. When his first stage of priest is called porter, the doorkeeper. It's the first stage of holy orders. And the bishop tells the young man who's going to become a priest when he becomes a porter, your duty is to stand at the door and to open the door and let the just come in and keep the wicked out. Your duty is to ring the bell. So that those who know that it is time for the religious services can hear that it is time for religious services and to ring the bell that terrifies the enemy that he knows that there is an army nearby. It shall be the bell of warning. It shall be the bell of calling to worship. It shall be opening the door that others may come in. Now this first duty of the porter, in fact, is the duty of everyone who is confirmed. Everyone who receives the sacrament of confirmation. And so therefore, when it says in the divine, when the divine gospel says to us, it was a time of Philip, in the time of Lasanias. I'll tell you all I know about Philip. His name was Philip. I'll tell you what I know about Lasanias. His name was Lasanias, and I can't tell you if it's the right pronunciation. One was Lasanias, the other one was Philip. Philip was the Tetrarch. So it says here that Philip and his, uh, that uh, Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, Philip, his brother, Tetrarch of Eturia, and the country of Trachonites, and Lasanias, Tetrarch of Abilina. And, and Annas and Caiaphas, you know. But who cares about Lasanias? Many of the fathers of the church, or enemies of the church, rather, had to be the fathers of the church defended against them, said, there are many foolish waste of time things in Scripture. Who cares about Lasanias? Who cares about Philip? Who cares about all the names that are in the book of Kings? We know that every one of those names is important. We know at the end of the world, when no judgment comes, I'm going to learn all about Philip. And we'll learn all about Lasanias. Right now, Lasanias is in hell, or Lasanias is in heaven. Philip is in hell, or he is in heaven. And Philip had a part to play in the coming of Jesus Christ. He's important. And Lasanias had a part to play in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he's important. And I have a part to play, and I'm important. And you have a part to play, and you're important. And every one of us are soldiers in a battle. Each one must stand at their post. Each one must do their duty. We need pawns to be pawns. We need uh, uh, rooks to be rooks, knights to be knights, bishops to be bishops, and queens to be queens. This is what we need to be in order to be able to be on the battlefield of our Lord Jesus Christ. Each one must fulfill their role, and they're all important. And so that I am going to go to judgment. Jesus Christ is coming to judge me. You are going to go to judgment. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming to judge you. He's coming to judge all of us. Under what conditions is he going to judge us? What did you do as a soldier in my army? And a soldier is fighting a war against the kingdom of Satan. I'm not fighting against the guy who's shooting at me. When you're in an army, you're, you're in one side shooting your guns. The enemy's shooting his guns. Which one do you want to shoot? I want to shoot the guy who's got his gun aiming at me, which was number 17. I want to get him. You don't get number 17. You're shooting at all the enemy. You're not trying to get the one who's trying to get you. You're trying to get the one that's trying to get your kingdom, and that's every one of them. And that's why you go and you wipe them all out. And if you die in the process, that's fine. You take out some enemy with you. You fight in the battlefield, and you will receive your glory, and you will not be defeated. But we must remember we are soldiers in an army of Christ, and what I do 
in my own, but that I'm going to be judged for in my own personal judgment. When our Lord Jesus Christ comes to judge me, he's going to ask me, what did you do as a soldier in my kingdom? What did you do in order to prepare for my coming? What did you do to spread my kingdom? And one of the things that we're always required to do are the works of charity. Why do we do the works of charity? In order to capture souls from the kingdom of Satan and bring them into the kingdom of God. Why do you help the poor and the widows and the orphans? In order that they might see the goodness of God. In order that he might take them away from mortal sin and bring them out of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of heaven. So that when we do open the soup kitchens and when we uh, fight against Joe Biden who's trying to steal the election right now, when we, when we fight against the wicked ones, why are we doing this? Because these people are enemies of the kingdom of God and they need to be stopped in their wickedness against the kingdom of God. What's one of the problems now? And several million Americans. Now there's going to be a January the 6th is the next call. So we were there with the seminarians on November 14th. They're also a good December the 12th, our Lady Guadalupe, praying for the country. Now the President Trump has called for everyone in the country to come to Washington, D.C. on January the 6th. So on several million people on the Feast of Epiphany, the divine manifestation, the day when the three kings came to offer gold, frankincense, and myrrh and the greatest feast of the Christmas season. But they're going to come on January 6th, Wednesday I think it is, in order to go to Washington, D.C. Millions of people will probably come. Why are they going to come? Why should they come? And why are they going to come? The reason why they are going to come is because if Joe Biden gets in, and if the Democrats win, and the Communists fully take over our country, I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my house. I'm going to become more and more a slave of communism, and I'm going to live a miserable life, and I don't want to be miserable. What kind of soldier is that? St. Augustine says the type of soldier it is. He said, two loves built two cities. Love builds a city, builds a kingdom. The one is the love of self. Several million people are going to come to the capital, in order to say we Americans aren't going to stand up for this wickedness of this false election. And two days ago, the Pentagon blocked Biden out from he can no longer come for his meetings on the transition team. And so now it seems as though there's a shifting of, the, of, the, of President Trump and his team trying to save the election. So that they, they could remember Arnold Trump did win by a massive landslide everywhere in the country. And so we want Trump to be the president. Why do we want him to be a president? Millions of people are going to come. Does it mean they belong to the kingdom of God? They're going to be against the communism. Does it mean they're friends of Our Lady of Fatima? Because Our Lady of Fatima said that, that Russia will spread her errors throughout the world. And that Russia will not be defeated until the Pope obeys her heavenly request and consecrate Russia to the Magic Heart of Mary. Are we seeing several million people gather in, in, in Washington, D.C. to have heaven's request fulfilled? Do they really belong to the majority of them? Do they belong to the army of Christ? The simple answer is no, because they're not coming in order to be soldiers in the kingdom of Christ. They're coming to save their jobs to save their comfort, to save their freedom to continue to live a life of sin, to save their, their, their sinful, wicked lives. That's why the majority are coming. But why should several million people come? Why should they come? Because as soldiers of Christ, what do they consider? As a member of the army, I see that this man, and all that these Democrats are standing for, happens to be the kingdom of Satan. And as a soldier of Christ, I am an enemy of the kingdom of Satan. Not because the kingdom of Satan is bad for my bank account or bad for my health, but because the kingdom of Satan is bad for my king. It's bad for the kingdom to which I belong. And therefore, I can fight boldly and strongly. And remember, a soldier, the reason why a soldier is able to be so brave and a soldier is able to be so effective is because a soldier recognizes the life of his God the life of his country, the life of his principles of truth, 
are far more important than his miserable life. And therefore, he's able to go with great strength and great power into the battle. And he gives up his life to save the kingdom of God. If these are the soldiers that come to Washington, D.C., Satan is destroyed. But if the soldiers come to Washington, D.C., because it's one devil against another, two bank robbers steal money, and then they want to keep the money for themselves. And so they have a conflict. I just killed a bank robber. Well, you must be a good guy. Why are you killing a bank robber? Because you want to steal his stuff. That doesn't mean you're a good guy. You're not a good guy if you kill a bank robber. You're not a good guy if you stake stuff away from a robber. Unless you're killing him and stopping him in evil in the name of the king as a police officer. Unless you're going to return that money to the rightful owner. Unless you're doing it for the sake of preservation of the poor and the widows and the orphans. Because a soldier of God fights for others. And St. Augustine says, in the end, there are only two cities. Several million Republicans will be there. And several million Democrats. And they hate each other. Are they really enemies? If they belong to the same kingdom of the love of self, they're building the same city which is called pandemonium. They're building the same city which is called the city of hell. Therefore, they're not really enemies. We have to go and fight against the enemies of God because we are soldiers in the army of God. And I am going to be judged as a soldier. And you're going to be judged as a soldier. And as a soldier, we fight for the glory of our God and the glory of the true king. And that's what we have to do as we prepare for our own personal judgment. So Lassanias is important, and Philip is important, Annas and Caiaphas is important, and Peter, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, Jude, and Judas. All important. And each one decided, am I going to be a soldier of Christ or a soldier of Satan? Judas decided... He thought he decided, I'm just trying to get 30 pieces of silver. I'm not responsible for the death of Christ. I'm just getting a little bit of money. He's going to escape like he does every other time. And I get a little bit extra cash. It turned out it didn't work out the way he scheduled, the way he planned. He ended up in suicide and despair. He did not repent. He was a soldier in the army of Satan. And he thought he was just taking care of himself. Many souls today are going to try to take care of themselves. We are not here to take care of ourselves. We are to prepare for my own personal judgment by acting and living as a true soldier of the kingdom of Christ against the soldiers of the kingdom of Satan. I'm going to close that. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.